Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I stopped recording. I stopped recording because there were some bugs, uh, errors. So I corrected them and I'm restarting. Uh, yeah, so we were calculating E1 by KBT and this is Z, this is Z, this is Z. So what we have written here, so from this step, from this step, uh, the Z had been missing here, slash Z. So here I've added the Z. So the numerator, the numerator becomes minus 2x square by Z, right? And uh, for x much less than 1, x much less than 1, that is kBT much higher than mu b, then z itself can be written as z equal to e to the minus x plus e to the power plus x. And when you expand, because x is small, we can, uh, much smaller than 1, uh, then uh, we can ignore the higher order terms. So this becomes one minus X, this becomes one plus X and that is equal to two. So then E1, E1 uh, essentially becomes, there was two X square here, right? So, so this was calculated for E1 by KBT. So I've removed the KBT here. So from X square, you have only one KBT. This becomes mu B. Um, yeah, so you would have got mu b by kBT whole square. Instead, you have mu b by kBT to mu b because one kBT has cancelled it. And then uh, there was this minus 2 here and this 2 comes from the partition function. Right? So this is the expression for E1 when kBT is large when kBT is large so this here and basically what you get is mu b into a small factor because mu b by kBT is a small number it's much lesser than one right so you get a fraction of uh, you get a fraction of minus mu b would, which would be the energy per spin. Yeah. This is per spin uh, when the temperature was very low. Of course, if you multiply by N, then you will get for N particles. Yeah. So, so when spins were mostly, uh, when the spin had a very high probability of pointing in the direction of B, then the mean energy or the expectation value of energy would be minus mu b, however, at very high temperature, it is minus mu b into a small number, which is basically saying that the mean energy is zero because there's equal number of spins pointing up and down. But what is important here is also the, the functional form of CV, which is del E del T, right? Uh, and if you take that uh, mu b, because those are going to remain uh, constant, okay. with respect to derivatives, it goes as 1 by t square. So when you take a derivative with respect to uh, of, of t with respect to 1 by t, you get a, another minus sign. So Cv is positive, which is important. But here you see energy is negative, but Cv will always be positive. It's a positive quantity. You add a bit of you increase temperature, the average energy of the system increases, and that's this is one by t square, right? Uh, so, so in the part and before we had shown uh, the properties of magnetic moment at uh, high temperature and low temperature. Now we also got the expression for the mean energy, how the mean energy is varying. And we took its uh, its its, uh, its uh, low temperature limit and its high temperature limit. And we also calculated CV. Right. So this is the general expression for the average energy of the system and how it varies as function of temperature. So we have started with the microscopic hand Hamiltonian. 
calculating quantities for the thermodynamic one. Here, the thermodynamic one is very easy. You just have to multiply by L. Uh, so let's look at the other limit, right? So here, so here the x is much greater than one. So mu b by k b t is much greater than one. That is, the energy scale of mu b is much greater than k b t. And in that case, uh, for the energy for one particle system, and we will multiply it by n, is x. So this is the general expression: x into e to the power minus x minus e to the power x, uh, and where x is uh, mu b by k b t. Right? Uh, that's the formula. So here, so when x is much larger than one, uh, what happens is that uh, this is a large quantity. This is a very small quantity. I mean, rather minus uh, some. So e to the power minus a very large quantity, and this is th thereby uh, minus a very large quantity is like one by e. So which is like can be neglected. Right. So this is a large quantity. This is a small quantity. Uh, uh, similarly here. So this is a large quantity, and e to the power minus x or 1 upon e to the power x, e to the power x is a large quantity, so this quantity is close to 0, right? So, as a consequence, one gets, because the e to the power minus x can be neglected as minus x into e to the power, in the numerator e to the power x and in the denominator also there. Thereby, e1 by kbt becomes minus x, that's minus mu b by kbt, or energy so the system is minus mu b approximately. This, of course, at the when x is greater than one, much much greater than one. So when mu b is much greater than, so at very low temperatures, if you like. And for n particles, it is n minus n mu b. It's just because most of the spins are up. I mean, you can look at one spin or n spins. So the, most of the spins will be up. If you're talking about one spin, you'll say that this is up at the most of the times, hence you're getting this minus mu b. Okay. Uh, so we we could go get an expression for the average energy of a system uh, into n, if you're looking at n particles. And just to remind you that mu, uh, the, the, the magnetic moment is the Bohr magneton and energy factor into ping. So the specific heat capacity uh, in this limit, we are, we are now interested to calculate when mu b is much greater than kbt or temperature is very low. We are rewriting it uh, as, uh, so basically C b is del e del t, constant v and n, and this can be written as del del beta into del beta del t. Beta is 1 by kbt here, right? And this in turn, when we are taking uh, derivative of 1 by kbt with respect to t, we get a minus 1 by kbt square into del e del beta. And that's exactly what I've written here. So I'm writing down, so this is for one particle cv, and of course, you multiply by n, is minus 1 by kbt square del e del beta. And this in turn, I have written down the expression I have uh, written down the expression, uh, well, it's wrong up to a factor of kbt, I guess, because it's e1 by kbt, uh, well, no, this is correct, actually, because x has mu b by kbt, and this, and this kbt is cancelled, so you have mu, mu b e to the power minus x, minus e to the power x, yes, by the partition function. So you have to take a derivative with respect to this and we are going to calculate this when kbt is very low. Uh, so in that case, we are calculating Cv again. So we had got magnetic moment, we had got an expression for chi, then we are calculating energies and the specific heat capacity. These are the thermodynamic quantities you easily measure in the lab. And all that we have to do is then take a derivative uh, with respect to del del beta. Here you have a kbt sitting here. Here you have kb and here you have kbn. So what we are doing is first take a derivative of the 
numerator, right, uh, which is in this expression. Uh, basically, when you take a derivative with respect to beta here, you will get this mu beta, you will get an extra term of mu beta here, mu b, mu magnetic moment determined the magnetic field, you get a minus sign here, right? And here again, you have a minus sign, which will come because in the exponent had the minus sign into one by z. And here, uh, now you're taking derivative of the denominator. So you have a minus one by z square and uh, this numerator remains as it was before. But now you have, mm, you will have a mu b, so uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So you will get a mu b on taking a derivative with respect to beta and minus mu b for getting a, a derivative with respect to beta, right? So if you look at this ca uh, expression carefully, uh, so you will get a minus uh, z square. I'm sure I must have uh, taken, I don't know. So you had a minus one zeta here. I don't know whether there is a mistake here or not. Mm, where did the minus sign go? Mm, I think I'm taking this minus sign outside. Yeah, I'm sure I've taken this minus sign outside. So you get a plus and then, then you get mu b e to the word beta mu b. Yeah, you get a whole square here. If you take the minus sign out, you get a whole square here by z square. Uh, then what we do is, you know, uh, e to the power mu b by beta is a large number, right? So we can't in any way do a, a expansion and keep the small numbers. But if we take out e to the power 2 mu b, and basically just take out e to the power 2 mu b and there's a whole square, then what you have is 1 minus, I mean, we're just expanding, we're just expanding uh, this whole square here. And similarly from, the similarly from the denominator, we are taking out e to the power 2 mu b by beta, which is a large number, but this, cancels from the numerator and denominator and what you have is one plus two e to the power mu b beta. Now this is a large number, right? This is a large number, but e to the power minus a large number is a small number. So hence now what you do is a binomial and take this term in the numerator, you get a whole square. We are neglecting these terms. And if we just work out the algebra, you'll get minus one by KBD square into e to the power minus two mu b into beta, right? This was for low temperatures. So, so now just qualitatively speaking, uh, we I here I've plotted schematically the, well, uh, the variation of E1, E1, and at low temperatures, it was nearly fixed. At high temperatures, it was nearly fixed. But I mean, it was relatively constant because all spins are pointing up here, all spins, equal number of spins are pointing up and down. And in between, you'll get a peak. And that because when uh, mu B and KBT are comparable, then the energy is changing extremely fast. Correspondingly here, CV will be close to zero. Again, here CV will be close to zero. I mean, like it will be relatively flat. It will be relatively flat. And in the and here where E1 is changing fast, quickly, relatively quickly with temperature, you'll get a peak. But we have also calculated uh, the high temperature, uh, sorry, this is the low temperature limit of CV and this was the high temperature limit of CV. So experimentally, you can verify whether CV at high temperatures changes as one by T square. On the other hand, at low temperatures, whether it changes one by one by KBT square, 
a into exponentially minus mu b by kbt. Now, uh, you might think for, so this is the properties of C V at low, at low t and at high t. Now you might think, well, you have minus mu b by kbt, right? Uh, as, a, as a minus x if you like, uh, but remember, kbt is in the denominator. So hence, even as t increases, this quantity actually decreases. Uh, so, 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 so at very low t, this number would be relatively close to zero, whereas uh, close to zero into a prefactor, whereas t increases, this quantity actually decreases. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So basically, this factor, the mu b by kbt, actually decreases, and the as a consequence, you see an increase in c as you increase t here. And here, of course, there's the peak. But for that, you have to calculate the exact expression and take a derivative with respect um, so cv with respect to t and you can figure out the position of the peak so this this kind of cv where it is relatively the cv is relatively flat at very low t and again is relatively flat at high t uh, in between it is increasing as uh, like as an exponential here yeah, it is decreasing as a 1 by uh, t square uh, that's the property of specific heat uh, for systems with the energy gap uh, between the ground state and the higher energy state. So this is discussed in uh, Kardar actually. Uh, so I'll just tell you the, the chapter of Kardar. Uh, oh, well, I have pointed, written it, section 4.3. So here we did our calculations in uh, partition functions. In Kardar, what they have done is uh, calculated the same quantity in terms of um, in the microcanonical ensemble where the total energy of the system is fixed, right? Uh, but they get the same relation. So I th just thought that was a very nice physical insight of what is happening and characteristics of CV for systems with the energy gap. Uh, so though I started from Rife, I, this discussion is better there. It's very brief, but it's there in Kardar section 4.3. Okay, so till now we have been discussing about um, systems with only up spins and down spins, like uh, spin half systems, uh, right? But, uh, well, I have already told you uh, that in ferromagnetic, you have the so-called Curie-Weiss law, whereas the Curie law, the chi goes as one by T, and we already derived it, um, at least for the paramagnet and for the ferromagnet, we have to wait till the next class. But, um, uh, but I want to go ahead where you have multiple numbers. So where the magnetic uh, quantum number uh, does not have only plus half and minus half. Instead, it can have any value minus j, minus j plus one, uh, minus j plus two, and so on and so forth up till j. So then uh, what would be the functional form and would it match uh, with what is seen in experiments? Because that's what I showed in Rife. So, so again, uh, what you would have is, uh, you know, what you have is essentially, uh, we're writing down the energy of a microstate um, for n spins, right? Uh, and uh, the energy of a microstate is the magnetic moment of each spin. So I runs over each spin into B. So if the spin is up, uh, then it would contribute minus mu b um, up being the direction of b. And if it is down, um, it would contribute plus mu b. So sometimes, uh, so this is the energy of a mi microstate, if you like the Hamiltonian. But at times, I, repla I have by mistake, I've replaced b by h. So this h, so Hamiltonian here, I don't use e to the minus h per Hamiltonian. Uh, so just in case you see an h here, in e to the, then you should just remember this like magnetic field. Yeah. So partition function is sum over all microstates, right? Uh, e to the power minus beta energy of that microstate. So this is um, summation over i, summation over i minus mu b 
sum over all spins and this is summation over g sum over all micro states all different arrangements so just assume i mean just think like there was spin one two three four five six seven eight in a line uh, along a lattice and this was up 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 down up down up so that would be one microstate it would be have some value of energy which would sit here and the second microstate suppose like only this pin is flipped up so this is another microstate it would have a separate energy value so that is this this sum and this sum is over the energy of a microstate the energy of this microstate the energy of this microstate the energy of this microstate Right. This is this is spin i j is this microstate one two three four. This is the this microstate. To to calculate the energy of one microstate, you have to sum over the different spin. I want to differentiate between i and j, and I hope you don't make a mistake here. Now, as we shall see, if the spins are non-interacting. The partition function in general can be written j uh, sum over j sum over microstates and then uh, these are the spin values at each lattice site mu1 mu2 mu3 uh, so on uh, into b right and this in turn can be written as this can be uh, so this sum right uh, let's assume that mu can take only plus and minus then this can be written as actually e to the minus beta mu 1 b, where mu 1 can take uh, plus mu and minus mu value dot product e to the power minus beta mu 2 into b, where mu 2 can take two values plus and minus. And you go to the third spin, which can take plus and minus values and so on. So remember, this was sum over microstates. I'm writing down the partition function, but now I'm writing it like this. This is over the different microstates of individual spins. What was this? This was essentially Z1. And you have identical terms, N of those terms, if there are N spins. So this is Z1 to the power N. Right now, in case somebody has any confusion, how this can be written like this? There was some question in class. I will just explain that in gory details. Suppose there was just three spin, uh, then you could write it as e to the power minus beta mu one b when mu one is pointing down, and this is uh, you know the contribution when it was pointing up. So this is essentially this term when you have summed over mu1 and mu2. And similarly over the second one. And so this is essentially this term if you like. And then this is the third term. This if you like and so on and so forth. And I said that this is, this is also equal to the partition function. If anybody has any confusion, why is that so? Uh, please note that when you multiply this, when e each of these terms, so basically this will multiply into this, right? You will get four terms from here and these four terms will be multiplied by this term, which will give four terms and this term, which will give four other terms, right? And you can just check it out that you will essentially get these. So total you will have eight terms. Right, there are three. So each spin can be up and down independent of others. So you will get these eight terms corresponding to these eight microstates. So even if you wrote it like this, like this, like this, Z1 to the power n form, which I had just mentioned in the previous class, uh, if, so that is essentially this is Z1. For the first particle z1 for the second particle z2 if you like z3 for the third particle and so on and so forth and if you multiply them you will essentially get mu1 plus mu2 i mean whatever plus minus plus minus uh, whatever values these take into p and that would be energy over my, some microstates and since there are eight microstates 
you will have eight term uh over the summation and you will see it will set as mu1 plus mu2 plus mu3 and so on and so forth if there were two more spins then you would have 16 terms right uh similar to z1 to the power n i mean if z1 to the power 4 you would have 16 terms and so on and so forth Okay. Please think about this in case there is any confusion, because if there isn't, I wouldn't want to be too verbose. Uh, so now we are going to discuss, suppose the magnetic moments could take any values from minus j to plus j. So in that case, the energy of these different micro for one particular spin, for one particular spin, and of course you can take z1 to the power n as I explained, but instead of two states, that each spin could take. Now it can take 2j plus 1 spins. So j can take values from minus j, minus j plus 1, so on, so forth, 2j minus 1, 2j. So 2j plus 1. So these are the uh, energy values that a spin can take as it takes different orientations with respect to b. So when we were calculate, so when you are calculating magnetic moment, one spin, yeah, then the sum will be m equal to minus j to plus j magnetic moment which is mu zero into m. Yeah, so mu zero is g into mu b into whatever is the magnetic quantum number to e to the power mu zero b m beta. I've just written it explicitly. So this we were writing previously as mu. This quantity we were writing as mu. Right now, I'm writing mu zero into B, the magnetic quantum number, right? Uh, where mu zero itself is a multiplication of this into beta. Uh, so this is this would give the this would give the probability of occupation of that microstate for one spin into the magnetic moment. And this in turn can be written as one by z beta. Uh, Del del beta because if you take a derivative with respect to beta, these terms will come down. This is mu zero m, but an extra bit, um, an extra uh, magnetic field. Sorry, uh, so we are taking a derivative res with respect to the magnetic field. Yes, this is a derivative with respect to the magnetic field. Uh, so this in turn can be written as one by beta del del b the magnetic field into ln z1 and that is the expression for the magnetic moment mean magnetic moment the expectation value of magnetic moment of one spin so we can then also write down the partition function in, in this manner because if you write down the partition function then we can easily calculate the magnetic moment right this is the general expression and here then to calculate the partition function of one spin, we are summing over all the different energy microstates that one spin can take, summation over minus j to plus j, e to our beta mu zero m into capital B, this B being the magnetic field. Now beta mu zero B, we are writing as eta, just to, so just so that it's easy to write. So this summation can be written as m goes from minus j to plus j e to the word eta m. Now I want to remind you that this is just a GP series where a is a to the power a is e to the power minus eta j r is e to the power eta and a r to the power n because when you have to sum it up, sum up the GP series this is a into r to the power n is e to the power minus eta j, which is a into r, and there are 2j plus 1 terms. Hence, n is 2j plus 1, and you are writing e eta 2j plus 1, and this gets begets you, this gets you e eta j plus 1. Just think about it. And if you just put all of these in the formula, what you get is this e to the power eta j right which is a 
a into r to the power n is this term as I showed here. And this is 1 minus r. To make, to make this term look symmetric, I'm multiplying it, or the books have multiplied it uh, by e to the power minus eta by 2 and e to the power minus eta by 2. Repeat, just a reminder, the consequence of which uh, you will get an expression which is uh, like j to the power half, j to the power half here, right? And uh, yeah, yes. Uh, which in turn can be written as si sine hyperbolic like this and like this, right? Uh, I think it should come with a minus sign. I'm not sure. So, no, uh, oh, okay. You'll get a minus sign here and you'll get a minus sign here. So hence you are getting a, a sine hyperbole. Okay. Yeah, so you'll get a sine hyperbolic by sine hyperbolic. You're taking out a minus sign from both the numerator and denominator. And then when you calculate the magnetic moment for one spin, and if you multiply by n uh, using this formula, then you're taking the log first, so log of z1, and then taking a derivative with respect to the magnetic field capital B, so this is log sine hyperbolic. So you're taking log of this minus log of this. Then you're taking a derivative with respect to capital B. And there's a 1 by beta sitting here. And the consequence, uh, because there's a log, you get sine hyperbolic j plus half beta. And when you take a derivative of this quantity, you get cos hyperbolic with this prefactor. Right. And similarly, from here, this sine hyperbolic, because there's a log, it comes to the denominator. When you take a derivative of this, it appears here with this prefactor. Like you have j, uh, j plus half, and here you have half. Now, this particular function, this particular function, and if you multiply it by 1 by j, so you're introducing a j in the numerator and j in the denominator. This function is called the Brillouin function. Why are we writing? Why did we introduce a j in the numerator and uh, in the denominator? Because we'll see that at low temperatures, the, the value of the Brillouin function is nearly one, and the magnetic moment uh, you will get as mu zero g. Right. Uh, so so this so so now we are looking at the properties of the Brillouin function, we're just rewriting it. it. It looks a bit complicated, but it is nothing but cot hyperbolic. Right? So if you just look at this, there's a cos sitting here and the sine sitting here. So you have a cot hyperbolic. So what you have in the Brillouin function is 1 by g. So there was a 1 by g here. Cot hyperbolic, I mean, a prefactor and j plus half eta minus half hot hyperbolic half eta, where eta has been just this quantity. So it looks very complicated, but if you note, it is not. You are just writing mu as this function and calculating the value of z, z1. z1, and once you get this value of z1, which is this sine hyperbolic expression, just taking a log and taking its derivative as a consequence of which you are getting two cot hyperbolic terms with g plus half sitting here and half sitting here. What I want to emphasize is when we just consider two microstates, the previous version of paramagnetism, we got tan hyperbolic mu n for n particles is n into mu tan hyperbolic. So mu, I mean mu one, if you like, is mu tan hyperbolic, and then everything is is, is the same. Here you are getting this Brillouin function, not exactly. It's mu zero j into the Brillouin function. 
And this looks very different. This is like caught hyperbolic. But I have checked it out and I please on yourself check it out that when you plot, so caught hyperbolic goes like it looks very different from tan hyperbolic, but you don't have caught hyperbolic. You have caught hyperbolic j plus half multiplied into this quantity minus caught hyperbolic half eta. And if you note, if you put you take this tan hyperbolic and take j equal to half. Remember, there it was mu zero uh, and minus mu, uh, sorry, mu plus mu and minus mu. But the mu had mu zero, the Bohr magneton, if you like, into land energy factor into the value of j, that would be half, right? If you substitute, you would see that these look exactly the same. Okay, I have checked it out. You should do the same. I'm just going to tell you about the high temperature uh, limit of uh, the high temperature limit of uh, the Brillouin function. The Brillouin function at the high temperature limit can be shown to be. Uh, so basically, eta has to be much less than one for the high temperature limit because it's a matter of comparison. Uh, of mu b by kbt. So when kbt is high, then mu is much less than 1, then mu 1 will be uh, on putting in the various terms mu 0 b to j into j plus 1 kbt. So what you get is the 1 by t factor. And when you take a derivative, I mean, of course, you multiply it by n to get the magnetization of the entire sample of n particles. And you take a derivative with respect to b, you again get chi goes as 1 by t, which was the Curie's law. On the other hand, at low temperatures, uh, so at low temperatures, uh, where eta is much greater than 1, dj will be shown to be equal to 1 can be shown to be equal to 1 and then mu 1 equal to mu 0 j and for n particles this is n mu 0 j right. So I have already mentioned about the Curie's law and if you plot this, if you plot this for different values of g keeping mu 0 b by kbt constant uh, you would see that this below a function at higher ages it saturates at a higher value. Moreover, here the slope is also different and higher j's correspond to different uh, slopes, right? And you can calculate your chi essentially because chi will be, uh, I mean, you take a derivative with respect to b, you will get your chi. And uh, yeah, I will just show, I'll end this class by, by just showing where we started off and this is exactly the nature of these different Brillua functions which have been fitted for different paramagnetic cases and they rarely match. What is the message? The statistical physics even for large number for large number of degrees of freedom if you can guess the macroscopic Hamiltonian you can get the thermodynamic properties and its function with temperature and magnetic field. And for some systems, for systems which are really paramagnetic, very, very small interaction between spins, uh, if you can write down the right Hamiltonian, you can really quantitatively match the thermodynamic properties starting from calculations of the macroscopic, microscopic quant uh, Hamiltonian and statistical mechanics gives you, gives you the formalism to connect the microscopic Hamiltonian with the macroscopic thermodynamic properties. With this, I'll finish and we'll start discussing ferromagnetism from the next class.